from in Singapore, Gerald Bernard. which 
you're interested in the kind of stuff I'm talking about, it's worth reading because there's a lot more detail in there. And they say, our ideal candidates are the ones who keep learning. They have the smart to handle massive change and the character to love it. Because we know whatever job you're hiring for now is likely to be completely different in two years' time. And you need the people that can cope with that and enjoy that change. So how do we do it at Google? Well, we've got four hiring criteria that we hire against. They're top secret, but I'm going to share them with you know, a few other people. The first one really relates back to that, that obsession about learning and continued learning. We call it general cognitive ability, and it's really about how someone deals with a the problem they've never seen before, the approach they take to problem solving, and how they can keep learning as they, as they move through their role. The second one is leadership, and this isn't just about people management. It's really about how do you lead through change in an ambiguous and uncertain environment. What projects do people deliver? Who have they brought on board to deliver those projects? The third is goobiness, which I always thought was a bit like uh, the dinner party test. Who would you want to sit next to for two hours? Um, tick or cross, depending on, uh, on how well they interview. It's not really about that. It's actually more about motivation. Does their, do their motivations align with the company's culture? What have they done for their teams recently? What have they done for broader society? And then the final thing, and before I joined Google, I think the only thing really that I interviewed for was role-related knowledge. But it's just one component. This is what technical expertise, what role-related knowledge has that person already got that they bring to the job. It's very important as well not to let the hiring manager make the decision. Because the hiring manager has got pressures. They want someone who can come on board and finish the project that they need to finish in six weeks using the tools that they know they need to know. What well, using a committee, and Google has an extensive hiring committee and multiple stage interviews, it's quite a drag. What using a committee allows you to do, especially for data and analytical talent, is expose them to the broader organization and get a sense of can they can they explain simple, can they explain complex uh, con complex concepts in a simple 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 way and interact with senior management in a way that will help them deliver for you as an organization. So you've hired these amazing people, but you know the industry is changing. How do you keep them motivated and keep them trained so that they're at the top of their game? Well, Google's got a fairly amazing record in terms of training. You get exposed to an awful lot of training. But what's interesting is that it isn't just a kind of top-down, here is what we think you need to know for your job. It's very much bottoms up. What do you want to learn? What do you think you need to succeed moving forward? And that doesn't come top down. One of the most interesting schemes, wrong button, sorry. It's going to happen once. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. One of the most interesting schemes is Googler to Googler. So uh, G to G. And this is where any person working at Google can set up a course for other Googlers to help, to help uh, communicate that knowledge. It was a fascinating one on machine learning recently, but there's also others on things like yoga. Um, anyone can teach other Googlers anything they want. And so from your point of view in your organization, have you, are you facilitating that kind of intra-learning? And if you're from a very small organization, are you helping your people get the time with the network that might well extend beyond your organization so that they can do peer-to-peer -peer learning? This could be using online, online tools like Coursera. Uh, or it could be encouraging your people to come to events like this. Another example, very famous, but famous more for its impact on innovation for its 20% of time. So engineers and everybody at Google is encouraged to, to, to take on project work with a certain proportion of their time that isn't core to their day job. So things like Gmail famously grew out an engineer's 20% time, or a group of engineers' 20% time. And it has a really big impact on innovation. But it's also an amazing training tool because it gives people scope to fail. Teresa talked yesterday about, uh, about the importance of being able to fail and fail well in businesses. And 20% time is a really tangible example of that. For data analysts and for data people working in, in, in data innovation, it's essential to have the time and the space to innovate at the edges without the pressure of having to deliver success every time. And we do 20% time, we can call it what we like. Because give people, build into their workloads that space to do this.
It also helps massively with retention. Now, retention, if, if you're going to hire amazing people, you do, it goes without saying, have to, have to pay them decently. But with data analysts and people working in, in computer science often, that money isn't prime motivator. Giving them an objective that is really audacious and helping them, giving them the support to get there is what will keep them motivated. It's all a Google point of view, this. And I understand that not everybody has Google's scale, Google's brand, uh, Google's culture. And I didn't want to make this entirely a Google presentation. So I'm going to invite some special guests onto stage. We've worked closely, very closely, with the IDA on a company led training scheme that we launched this year called Square Data, where we recruited 20 fresh graduates from Singapore universities. And we gave them two months of intensive training within Google. Googlers gave up their time. We had external agency partners come in to give up their time and their expertise to help take those 20 people through real business problems that had three speaking projects to work on in those, in those two months um, and get real exposure to, to the industry. Those guys are now in an eight-month placement at the media agencies in Singapore. And I'd like to welcome on stage Sebastian and Sam, let's give them a, a, a data work welcome. Thank you for joining us, guys. And uh, don't be scared, they're very nice, very nice all of us. So first off, it's a bit of an introduction. Um, what got you interested in data and analytics? And how did you hear about this particular program? Um, maybe a slight introduction first. Uh, my name is Sebastian, and I'm a recent graduate from Singapore Management University. Uh, I major in uh, Information Systems Management as well as uh, accounting. So I actually have some background in data management as well as accounting uh, analytics. So it didn't take long for me to decide that data analytics was possibly one of the newest things that the industry has to offer. And uh, given such an awesome brand name such as Google, it didn't take long for me to hop onto the bandwagon as well. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm a statistics graduate from NUS. So uh, what got me interested in an analytics was during my undergraduate years. As I say, I close that when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. So I, I was approaching every problem in my everyday life from a statistical standpoint, and I realized that hey, actually analytics is something that I'm really interested in. So uh, since I semester, I think the first thing that drew me into this Google Study Lab program is a brand name of Google. And secondly, I think a company-led training framework is awesome because uh, as my first job, it will be a very nice framework and opportunity to like learn to bridge the gap between classroom knowledge and real-world applications. So I decided to go for it. Yeah. Fantastic. So there are people in this audience who could be future employers. What advice can you give them about motivating you as you move through employment for the next couple of years? So I think first and foremost, like uh, an ideal employer would be someone that is actually genuinely invested in our, my own personal growth and development. So to be more than a boss, more like a mentor figure. And also to be very encouraging uh, in terms of innovation and trying new things, you know, experimenting new and analytical methods. And so as per, and of course, as with all experimentation, there should be always some tolerance towards failure. So there's uh, ideally a healthy environment with that experiment and then build the commitment and so on. Yeah, I think for me, uh, the question of motivation is kind of critical uh, from an employer standpoint because for me, it's more some different kind of thing. But I think uh, what employers can do is try to create a more conducive environment for learning. And what I've noticed uh, quite often is that just as how an enthusiastic MC can get the crowd uh, excited, I think an enthusiastic manager or leader can actually push the motivation and drive these employees as well. And I think the second thing I want to talk about is uh, how uh, employees should give uh, ownership and task to new hires and employees, no matter how small the tasks are. Because this, this sense of ownership will create a sense of responsibility for, for employees, and it also gives uh, motivation for them to do their best. And I think, um, last but not least, it's uh, exposure to senior management. Because as ground staff, most of us are actually uh, we, we feel kind of a disconnect between the company's objectives and our own objectives. So I think exposure to senior management and knowing what a company's objectives are and knowing 
uh, when the direction of uh, the company is headed towards the power law in terms of motivation. Yeah, it takes back to, to some of the points I was saying about the type of person you recruit should be hungry to do that and should be capable of doing it. In terms of, obviously you need to keep learning. How can employers help you help you keep learning? What, what examples can I give? So I think that um, the general company or key outlook towards learning really, really affects how each individual employee views learning. The fact that Sebastian and I are allowed or even encouraged to attend this conference on two working days is actually a very great sign that our employers are actually really invested in our learning. So I think that's awesome. And also another example I can think of is that a fellow Sweat um, friend of ours, uh, his employer actually encourages the entire team to take up for Sarah courses yeah, in their own time and actually gives them a specific goal of 100 hours a year. So I think that all these tangible managers really send a very clear message to all employees that hey, learning is actually encouraged, it's awesome. So and uh, indirectly, it will encourage the employer themselves to always constantly upgrade their skill set. Yeah, I think uh, building on top of what Sam is talking about and what Jared has presented earlier on training, which I won't elaborate further because it's a very important aspect of what employees are looking for. I think what employers can do more is to actually uh, expose new employees to a wider network of subject matter experts because data analytics is such a new field. Uh, everybody doesn't know where to begin, they don't know what they do. So uh, the important thing on networks is to actually help people to find the right people and ask the right questions in order to get them to uh, gain the relevant domain, domain knowledge. So, thanks. And we've got 20 people in the program, but there's a lot more we'd like to get into data analytics. What can we do to encourage more people into this industry as in well, I think uh, one of the biggest hindrances into this industry is actually uh, uncertainty because of how new it is in Singapore and, and in Asia in general. Uh, it's not as developed as it is in uh, the Western countries. So uh, I have some friends even asking me, you know, uh, what what is this program all about and stuff. So misconception usually leads to uncertainty. So I think where we can target them is uh, when they are in schools. So students in universities, uh, universities can actually help to uh, bridge the gap between uh, classroom experiences and uh, industrial applications. So uh, this actually affirms you know, any uncertainties that they have, clarifies any uncertainties they have towards this industry. Yeah, right. So uh, Daryl made a point about uh, hiring someone based on their qualities and attitude, their hunger to learn, say on specific skill sets. I can relate to that because I actually have several friends, they are awesome people, they are awesome learners, but they, they actually like hesitated to apply for certain analytics positions simply because they said, oh, you know, well, I'm not good at the group or this certain uh, statistical method. So they said, nah, they're not going to consider me. So I think that uh, as a whole, from a hiring perspective, if you kind of shift the angle towards uh, and, uh, broadcasting the message that, hey, that data analytics needs problem solvers instead of people with certain skill sets, you will kind of encourage more people to take a look at the industry and also to, and, uh, in the long term, broaden the talent of people who will enter the data analytics. Thank you both very much, guys. We're already out of time, which I find unbelievable. But um, can we just give these guys a round of applause? And I'll, just, I'll just wrap up very quickly by saying, if there were three things uh, well, I'm going to be doing this. Three things to leave you with. First off, recruit for potential, learning potential, not the skills that people have already got. This will broaden the amount of people that are eligible for your uh, for the recruitment that you're doing, and it'll mean that you end up with a really interesting, interesting recruitment choice. Make sure that your data talent can flourish. Make sure that they've got that opportunity to learn on the job, whether that's 20% time, whether it's coming to things like this, whether it's connecting them with Coursera, uh, courses or giving them that time to do that. It's, it's absolutely essential to help them keep learning. And finally, how many of you actually do go into schools and universities and talk about what you're doing? A few hands up. Steve, absolutely. I think if everybody in this room, I know there are some students in this room as well, but if everybody who works for an organization that's innovating in data, data analytics, took a little bit of time out to visit the universities here, to visit the schools here, we could have an absolutely enormous impact on the number of people who look towards this industry as the exciting place that it is. So if there was one thing to do, it's think about how you can build that into the next month, two months. 
Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Oh, Gerald, before you go, uh, working at Google, is it anything like the movie The Internship? I have to admit, I haven't seen the movie. Go away. Go away for the research. I couldn't, I couldn't bear to watch it. <laughs> You're afraid. He's afraid it's of It's very good, our, our own little recruitment drive. It's a, it's a brilliant place to work. Okay. Thank you. Just kidding. Thanks, Gerald. <laughs> Okay, the next gentleman uh, taking the stage in just a second, you did meet him yesterday, he's coming to us from Toronto.